um, we won't be able to tell how many people are watching on the YouTube channel, right? Yeah, eventually. Yeah, I'll, uh, yeah. Okay. And but but the YouTube channel is also live right now. Uh, yes. There's okay. a few minutes delay. A few seconds delay. I think like 10, 10, 10 seconds delay. Something. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, three o'clock. Um, uh, good good afternoon. And you know this is uh, uh, the Society of Simulation Healthcare. Uh, healthcare system modeling simulation affinity group uh, webinar. I am Yue Dong from Mayo Clinic. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, introducing one of the speaker today. Uh, our speaker today. Uh, the, today's topic is uh, is the uh, clinical capacity planning and with discrete simulation. Uh, our speaker is Dr. Elgin Day. Uh, he is a senior e improvement advisor and a principal investigator with the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He specializes in discrete event simulation of healthcare delivery system with the goal of the understanding the complex nature of the clinical system and then applying this understanding to the improving healthcare delivery, efficiency, and safety. Elgin uh, uh, has been an active member of our group in the last uh, couple of years, and I'm um, glad to be, take his busy time to present him with the group. Elgin, uh, uh, it's your turn. Excellent. Thank you very much for your introduction, UA, and uh, I'm very pleased to be able to uh, contribute in this uh, venue. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my slideshow here so that I can talk about the work that we have done at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia using discrete event simulation specifically, and you should be seeing my slides now, um, in our to, to aid in capacity planning um, in our Center for Fetal Diagnosis uh, and Treatment and our Special Delivery Unit. Uh, as UA said, my name is T. Eugene Day. Uh, I am a Senior Improvement Advisor and Principal Investigator with the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, and my slides are not... There we go. Um, so I'm going to give a brief introduction, talk about the problem we want to solve, the methods that we use, the experiment that we conducted, the recommendation that we made, and then I'm going to, um, to briefly talk about how discrete event simulation can be used to support implementation science um, and implementation uh, and the adoption of recommendations from quality improvement projects. Um, by way of disclosures, um, the study that I'm talking about today was funded by uh, the University of Pennsylvania's Perlman School of Medicine through their Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy um, through a Implementation Science Working Group pilot grant. I personally have no conflicts of interest to report at this time, um, but I also wanted to um, acknowledge and um, and thank the, the people that worked with me on this project. Um, two student interns, uh, Nicole Ferraro from Drexel University and Courtney Reamer from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and then here at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Tom Reynolds, Lori Howell, and Dr. Julie Moldenhauer, um, who is a uh, maternal fetal medicine doctor in the clinic that we're discussing. So um, the Center for Fetal Diagnosis and Treatment um, and the Special Delivery Unit. I'm going to, by way of introduction, I'm going to describe those two facilities. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what discrete event simulation is. I think most of us in this affinity group already know, but I wanted to give a very brief background in the event that there's uh, other people listening in that do not know. Um, I'm going to talk about how to validate and experiment with DES models um, and make recommendation, and then implementation science and adoption. So the Center for Fetal Diagnosis um, uh, at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia is a specialized clinic which accepts healthy moms with known fetal anomalies um, through pregnancy intervention and delivery. Um, it opened in 1995 and we have treated more than 16,000 patients from more than 50 countries um, in that time. Uh, we treat a wide variety of fetal anomalies, including um, spina bifida and, um, and other 
serious um, uh, issues with um, pregnancy. Uh, once again, I want to I want to stress that we deal with healthy moms and um, and uh, the patient is the is the fetus. Well, the mother is the patient of two, of course, um, but the the intervention is performed for in order to to aid the, the fetus. Um, we currently offer uh, care for eleven conditions, including in utero surgeries. Uh, and I apologize in advance for any mistakes that I might make with the uh, the medical aspects of this. Uh, I am a systems engineer. I am not a physician. Um, and so all of the medical aspects of this entire research study were overseen by uh, physicians uh, in, and nurses in order to ensure that, uh, that we were appropriately addressing the, the medical issues. And, and I believe strongly in that entirely in all simulation modeling efforts in healthcare, um, physician oversight of engineering efforts um, is absolutely crucial. Um, so patients are referred, evaluated, and followed throughout the course of their pregnancy. Um, the initial visit that we conduct consists of a care coordination, uh, ultrasound, uh, fetal echo, MRI, genetic counseling. It may include psychology, social work, other specialist consults, and a maternal fetal medicine plan of treatment. Patients are followed up throughout their pregnancy. Um, and then neonatal interventions may also be planned as appropriate, but we're beyond the scope of this project. Once the baby is born, um, from the, the simulation aspect of our study, um, that, that is the terminal point of our, uh, of our analysis. Delivery occurs on the special delivery unit, which is our inpatient aspect. Uh, it's an 11 bed inpatient unit. It opened in 2008, and so far we have performed more than 1,800 deliveries. Patients stay on the inpatient unit for three or four days postpartum, depending on whether they've had a vaginal or a C-section delivery, and they may stay two to four days post-surgery. Um, there are occasional longer stays uh, following membrane ruptures, in which case we may have patients who stay in the SDU for up to maybe 12 or 15 weeks. Deliveries are planned for 37 to 39 weeks gestation. In the event of those membrane ruptures, uh, standard of care is to deliver at 34 weeks. Um, but of course, deliveries happen when they happen uh, sometimes, and uh, the special delivery unit is designed to facilitate that including having a one-room uh, emergency facility, which can handle um, the entire course of care for a spontaneous delivery. So the problem that we want to address with discrete event simulation um, is can we determine our capacity needs prospectively? So this program has been growing really, really rapidly. We've been seeing a 17% increase in the number of patient encounters per year. Um, that's been consistent and linear. We expect it to continue. Um, and in fact, we, we may expect it to accelerate. Um, there are other facilities uh, in the United States and around the world which can uh, perform at least some of the same interventions uh, and provide some of the same care that we can provide. But um, even as these other centers have opened, uh, we have nevertheless seen demand for our care continue to increase um, really at dramatic and rapid levels. Um, and so the question that we would like to know is what does our inpatient capacity need to be to continue to serve this population? We want, under no circumstances, to have to turn away a mom whose care we have been providing and who is ready to deliver and have her deliver elsewhere. We need to be able to ensure that we always have the inpatient space to satisfy 
the demand for service that we uh, encounter. And as of yet, we have never had one of our patients have to deliver elsewhere, and we have never had to turn away a patient um, who was appropriate for our treatment because we did not have the capacity to serve them, and we would like to keep it that way. Um, so how do we build, even if we can answer the question, what capacity do we need, how do we build an evidence base for institutional policy decisions? And this goes to the implementation science aspect. What does evidence supporting capacity planning even look like? Um, prior to this type of modeling analysis, we have to make um, some, some really large assumptions um, about what our demand is going to look like, usually in order to solve capacity planning problems. We have to remove a lot of the stochasticity from the environment because otherwise the mathematics are too complicated to, to solve in any kind of a reasonable time frame. So can we use these tools like discrete event simulation to make data-driven conclusions about our needs in this extraordinarily complex environment? So the method that we chose to use for this case, as I said, we, we needed to build a computer model of this very complex system um, that allows us to examine how process, patient care processes, how policy, how, capac how capacity combine to influence the throughput in this environment that allows us to highlight cues for service, tanks, bottlenecks that impact the delivery of services that may not be obvious when uh, observing the system from the outside. Um, it may not be easy to tell what patients are waiting for um, when you have long queues of patients. Um, and, and we want to be able to make prospective investigation of a simplified system. Essentially, we want a crystal ball. Uh, we would like to be able to look into some crystal ball and say, what does the future look like uh, based on the assumptions that, we're, that we have to make um, that simplify the system we're looking at? Now, of course, there's no such thing as a crystal ball. But there is such a thing as discrete event simulation, which allows us to build a graphical computer simulation of the model to project system behavior into the future. The graphical nature of it allows us to drive engagement with stakeholders. We can show them the model of the system. We can um, draw conclusions, answer what if and how would questions. What if our patient model changed? What if we had an additional MRI machine? And how would questions? How would our system change? under a different set of assumptions. And this can illuminate really complex interactions, which I'll get to later, which really can be non-obvious from the outside. So we model these real-time processes. And in order to build a discrete event model of a system, we have to decompose the system into its basic elements. Um, what are the entities? Um, what are, what are the entities in discrete event simulation parlance are the objects upon which work is done. So in a healthcare environment, entities are the patients, patient records, lab samples, maybe radiology images um, that we need to process in order to do the work that the system is trying to do. The resources are the objects that we have that allow us to do those things. So human resources, physicians, nurses, equipment, um, and, and all of the things that we use in order to treat our patient population. <laughs> Locations, the exam rooms where things occur, the ultrasound rooms, this, this system particularly has a lot of very specialized different locations where certain tasks can only take place in certain locations like ultrasound, fetal echo, um, and then well, they may be multi-purpose, they may be locations which can only serve one person at a time, or they may be able to be able to serve multiple people at a time. And then finally, the path networks. How do, uh, how can people move through the physical space? And then finally, what that allows us to do, once we have all of those sub-elements defined, 
is to answer the question essentially, how do entities consume resources at locations and then proceed along paths from one location to the next? Additionally, we another process flow that we need to define is how do resources search for work? So, for example, in an emergency department, uh, a physician, an emergency physician, does not necessarily look for the closest patient next. They may look for the most severe patient next, or it may be a, a complicated combination of severity <clears throat> and um, did time waiting, for example, um, or uh, in our case, how we choose which patient to see next may relate to external factors like how is the MRI running? Are they running on time or are they running behind? So we can answer these process flow questions that allow us to build a model of a system. Now, as an aside, in addition to answering questions with discrete event simulation, I, I feel like it's worthwhile to point out that the investigative nature of developing a discrete event simulation of a healthcare delivery system or of a clinical system can actually reveal targets for traditional improvement too. Sometimes um, when you're examining these systems, you will discover things that you don't need to simulate um, in order to to address basic quality um, issues. Um, but at the same time, some scenarios cannot or should not be simulated. Um, for example, in, the, in our case, we don't simulate specific staff or patient scheduling. Um, I, I personally don't feel that discrete event simulation is the best way to try to schedule individual patients. Um, I think there's often too much variation in the system to say, Jane Doe should be seen on August 4th at 7 p.m. Um, on the other hand, uh, I, I think there are better tools for that kind of, of very specific scheduling. On the other hand, for evaluating different types of schedules for multiple patients, discrete event simulation can be very useful. Um, we also don't attempt to simulate specific medical interventions. Um, this goes back to what I was talking about before. Engineers are not physicians. No one wants less than me for systems engineers and modelers to start trying to tell physicians how to practice medicine. That's a bad idea. Um, and so we do not even attempt to simulate, for example, uh, the fetal surgeries that we do. What we simulate is the process of putting a patient and a physician and a, and a, uh, a surgeon and a team into the operating room and have them uh, take the appropriate amount of time in an operating room and then say that the surgery occurs in simulation rather than trying to actually simulate a surgical process. Um, that's not what we're capable of doing here. Um, there are other kinds of simulation that, that do that work and it's fascinating, but that's not what discrete event simulation is for. Uh, and like I said, similarly, we don't uh, try to simulate highly technical processes of like the ultrasound machine. Um, so, discrete event simulation is used in healthcare quite a little bit. Uh, I'm not going to go into each one of these individually. Um, emergency, uh, cardiac, operating rooms, um, policy, public health, epidemiology. I'll make these slides available later, and I have these references at the end. Um, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia has used discrete event simulation in quality improvement, surgical flow, now here in the Center for Fetal Diagnosis and Treatment. Um, and additionally in uh, oncology trials, et cetera. So let's talk about actually modeling the patient flow within our Center for Fetal Diagnosis and Treatment. Um, on the outpatient side, um, we have a first evaluation appointment flow. And the first evaluation appointment um, is a, a specific process which is different from follow -up appointments later. Patients are referred, they arrive, um, they'll have their ultrasound or MRI, whichever they can have first, followed by an echo, a, a meeting with their patient coordinator, with the genetic counselor, and then once all of these things are done, um, they'll have their 
maternal fetal consult, which may include social work and psychology, after which they may have they have a couple of options um, in the simulation. And, and, and I should stress as well, too, these are the patient flows for the simulation. They are somewhat idealized. Um, because in the real world, for example, like I said before, if the MRI is running behind, perhaps we would switch with the echo. Sometimes those things can be incorporated into simulation. Sometimes it's easier and um, and more relevant to uh, assume a particular set of flows. Um, once a patient has completed their first day, their first evaluation, um, there's two things that can happen. They may exit the system. They may, they may say, they may be determined not to be a candidate for treatment here. They may choose not to be a candidate, uh, not to have their treatment here. Um, in which case they exit the system and don't return. They may follow up with us for some number of times but not transfer their care to us. That happens as well. Um, or they may transfer care and become a, a full-scale patient where we are in, uh, in, we are responsible for their care until the delivery of the child and after. In, in those cases, whether they follow up or they transfer care, um, we build a location in the model called home. And that allows the simulated mother in the, pa in the discrete event simulation to remain extant in the system, go home, and then return throughout the course of, of her pregnancy. Um, and that's the chief novelty of this simulation is in, for example, emergency room simulations, the patient negotiates their obstacle course of care and then exits the system permanently. We can't do that here. We need the patient to be able to return over and over again to our outpatient facilities and our inpatient facilities until they have completed what may be a, a five or six month course of care. Um, Follow-up appointments have ultrasounds. They may have, then they will have uh, history and physical and prenatal with an advanced practice nurse and uh, an MFM. They may have any one of social work, psychology, anesthesia, lactation, NICU. Um, each one of those, they must have at least one consult uh, for psychology and social work. They may have several. Um, and then they will return home. Over the course of their entire pregnancy, um, the flow looks like at a first evaluation, they may exit, they may follow up but not transfer care, or they may transfer care. Um, if they transfer care or follow up, um, they will go back and forth to home. Uh, frequently, most usually patients who follow up but do not transfer care will be having a twins procedure, which is a surgical procedure. Um, patients who transfer care may have a fetal shunt, they will eventually deliver and then exit the system once they've delivered. So we've talked about the simulation quite a little bit. Let me actually show it to you. So hopefully I will be able to share this. And if this isn't working, somebody let me know. This is the Center for Fetal Diagnosis and Treatment. Patients arrive here. While they are on their first evaluation, they are blue. Uh, and it's Sunday at the moment. So here we have, let me slow this down when we're in the middle of the week so we can see this. We have blue moms who are undergoing their first treatment, blue moms with the little red dot are here for specifically for the fetal heart program. So moms will arrive, they'll go to the waiting room, they will have their various consultations of ultrasound in this area, fetal heart program here, 
um, genetic counselor, and then at the end of the day, the first day, they will be here in this consult room where patients uh, will have their care planned. As time goes by, if we speed this up, you will eventually sort of see patients coming here from time to time. Some of these patients are uh, fetal surgery patients, some are C-section patients. Um, and this area in pink along the left side is the special delivery unit, and that's the capacity question that we want to answer. How many beds do we need in the special delivery unit in order to satisfy our demand as time goes on? Here on the right, we see all of the patients that we have following up. If they are green, they have transferred care. If they are orange, they are following up but have not transferred care. Uh, similarly, we see patients in MRI or X-ray, lab, and surgery. It keeps track of the number of C-sections and open surgeries that we've done, three types of basic surgeries that we keep track of in the simulation, open fetal surgeries, uh, scopes, fetoscopic surgeries, and shunts. We keep track of the total number of patients that we have seen throughout the course, course of the simulation, the current SDU census, and the current number of patients in our queue, which is the number of patients that we expect to deliver over the course of the next uh, four to six months. So as this simulation progresses, we can keep track of the total number of patients, babies, as you see here, babies, we keep track of our, our live births. And we can run this simulation for a number of years into the future. And we have a linearly rising arrival distribution uh, that was fit based on historical data to a Poisson distribution um, with, a, uh, with a mean that's rising at a rate of 17% patient encounters per year. So this allows us to determine over time uh, how what we expect our demand to be. So just a moment and I will return to my slides. Uh, so you should be seeing my PowerPoint slides again. If you're not, please let me know. Um, so how do we know that this model works? When Once we've built the model, we need to validate. There are, so best practices for the development and validation of discrete event simulation were established in 2012 by the Society for Medical Decision Making in a couple of, of really important papers, one by Carnan et al. and one by um, Eddy et al. Um, and they lay out the they lay out five types of validation which are useful in these systems. The first three that we use here are face validation, which is we demonstrate for the system stakeholders, the physicians, the nurses, um, the technicians who work in the system. And we ask them if it accurately represents their daily practice um, and the, the type of work that they do. Uh, additionally, we, for face validation, we look at the numbers that are coming out of the simulation and we, and we look to see that they pass the sniff test, essentially. Then there is internal validation, also known as verification, in which we do a thorough code review. And that was done by myself and by my student interns. And perform system stress tests. You know, what happens if we say, okay, we're going to have 10,000 moms a day run through this system. Now, obviously, the system can't handle that many. But those patients who 
reach the front of the queues should still be pr uh, processed as normal. There shouldn't be a collapse in the system. It shouldn't crash. Um, and then finally, external validation. We actually compare simulated data to real-world data and perform statistical hypothesis testing and ensure that we're not seeing significant, statistically significant differences um, in the way the simulation versus the real world behaves. Um, now, even if you do see statistically significant differences, uh, it is possible to be externally valid if you have a systematic bias. Systematic biases that are uh, you know predictable, um, we can correct for post hoc. Um, but in our case, we did not have that. So, uh, as an example of our validation, our external validation metric, we looked at the inpatient days, the census of the uh, special delivery unit on each day. We compared simulated data to real world data and, uh, and st performed statistical hypothesis testing and determined that um, we had no, we saw no evidence that the simulation was not producing uh, values based on the real world system. So assumptions for that are recent data has to be representative of future um, data. That's the best assumption that we can make, essentially, that uh, we are going to see sudden dramatic shifts in our demographics. All patients follow the normal flow process. We know that anomalies will occur and that orders could be switched, but that fundamentally um, in the simulation, patients are not going to dramatically deviate from the normal flow process. We assume that all patients who transfer care eventually deliver a CHOP um, so long as there is capacity on the SDU for them to do so. And also uh, that uncommon events do not unduly influence system performance. So for example, if we were to have a, a surgery that, um, that required you know, 36 hours, like a, a separation of conjoined twins um, that, that blocked off our uh, operating rooms for a great uh, many hours and, and caused a major disruption to our service, that the system will rebound from that in a way that we don't need to model the extraordinary um, occurrences. So, to experiment with this then, we want to know, based on the projected arrivals, uh, how much inpatient space do we need to avoid turning away patients? Can we build capacity for three to five years in the future? And how long will varying numbers of inpatient beds delay balks? So balking is a queuing theory term in this case. And what we, we define a balk to occur when, uh, when we have a 13th a patient occur, uh, present for care in the, the special delivery unit. Um, there are currently 11 beds in, in the real world. However, we have been really, really good at um, playing what we call, you know, sort of the cup game of moving things around. Um, there have been times we've had 12 patients and we've been able to manage it. Um, so even though we have 11 beds, we define the balk to occur when the 13th patient presents. Um, so we want to determine the mean time to walk with the current capacity. Um, and we essentially then simply increase the number of beds to determine the relationship between bed space and time to failure, time to that first walk. And that's how we conduct the experiment. We add a bed. We run the simulation out for five years. We determine when did the walk occur. We repeat this with uh, independent random number streams so that the uh, the simulation can be tested allowing stochastic stochasticity to influence our results. Um, in our case we ran the simulation for 12 statistically independent runs of five years each so with each level of bed we have 60 years of data uh, and we plotted the time to walk based on the number of beds that we had. And that's what we see here. Each blue dot is an individual run. The red line represents the mean. 
and it shows us how many beds do we need in order to avoid balking for as long as possible. Um, the 11 beds are our current state allowed us about 270 days until the next box. So we know that we are rapidly approaching um, the time at which a um, our, our nightmare scenario will happen. And uh, based on these results, we are already investigating opportunities and have been investigating opportunities for quite some time for how to address that. What's interesting here is that adding to 12 or 13 beds does not seem to make a huge difference. Um, it doesn't even double the amount of time that we would have until a, uh, a failure. On the other hand, at the 14th bed, we see a relatively dramatic increase. And going all the way up to 17 beds is required to ensure that we don't have a balk until at least about three years from now and, and maybe four or five. Um, I'm not going to reread the data, but this is the data and it will be available in the, in the slides. So. The recommendation, the official recommendation that we make based on the experiment that we conducted uh, on a validated model of our uh, healthcare delivery system in our environment, um, we have to recommend that at least six additional beds be dedicated to the special delivery unit in order to plan for the next five years, and that three beds are urgently needed to ensure the balking doesn't occur imminently, as you can see here. We have to go from 11 to 14 before we can be reasonably confident that we won't have a block in the very near future. So that's the official recommendation that we presented to our planning committee. And because we were able to present a data-driven case, um, as we're building our new burger center here for ambulatory care, and we will be um, opening up some space that's available, uh, we feel that we have a very good argument to be made that the SDU needs to be expanded um, uh, along these lines. So additional investigations that we've done with this now, that we're beginning to do with this now, are to examine, for example, the outpatient length of stay. We've looked very, very much in detail on the inpatient side. Um, it's time to look at the outpatient length of stay, uh, length of day, rather because these first evaluations with the mom can be very arduous. Sometimes they're up to 12 hours long. Patients are maybe traveling from very far away. We have a huge population that comes from other continents um, and needs to be treated in a way that, that is um, sensitive to how difficult the day is. So how can we complete all the tasks that need to be done and still minimize the patient's time equipment commitment? Um, and how do new patients and follow-up patients compete for resources? Now, like I said at the beginning, I don't believe that this is the best tool to use for specifically scheduling each activity of individual real-world patients. But various strategies can inform how uh, various simulated strategies can inform what's most likely to be effective at addressing these issues. So we ran a number of simulations in which we added consult room um, where the, the end of day um, consultation between the, the, the mom and the MFM takes place. Um, and these consult rooms are used for a lot of different services and they're always in high demand. Um, so we looked at adding a consult room and we saw a small, modest uh, improvement in the length of day, a 7% re um, relative reduction in the length of day for new evaluations and an 18% um, relative reduction in the length of, of day for follow-up moms. Um, when we added a new, um, a new patient evaluation ultrasound room, we actually saw a worsening of our times. Um, and it turns out that that was because they weren't, um, that wasn't an, an area where there was demand. And so all it ended up doing was forcing a lot of moms through the ultrasound and then having them wait even longer for other constrained resources. 
Um, when we added an additional consult room and a follow-up ultrasound, we started to see some really significant reductions in the follow-up length of stay. But again, not so much for new evaluations. Where we really found the bang for our buck for new evaluations was with adding new space for fetal echo. And part of the reason for that is that we have the fetal heart program is a, is a semi-independent unit. It's not exactly part of the Center for Fetal Diagnosis and Treatment, um, but they share a lot of resources and they, and they do a lot of work uh, on the same moms. And so when we added new space for fetal echo, the relative reduction in the new evaluation, first evaluation day for new moms, um, was really dramatic. We jumped to about a 40% reduction length of day. Now, I don't necessarily expect to see a 40% reduction in the real world, but I think it is safe to say that it will make a significant difference. But look at the interesting thing that happens when we added the consult room and the echo. We actually made follow-up days worse. And the reason for that is, once again, that the follow-ups who used to be able to slide through while the first evaluation moms were waiting for echo, um, no longer could, and were competing with those new moms for a lot of the same ultrasound services and radiology and consult rooms, etc. And so that's one of the real strengths of discrete event simulation is that it allows us to identify these extraordinarily complex interactions. Um, so we ran it again with an additional consult room, an additional follow-up ultrasound, and an additional echo, um, and we achieved a 40% and a 21% reduction. And then finally, by just swamping the, the system with additional resources that we don't believe we could ever achieve in the real world, um, we were we saw only a 43% and a 40 and a 23% reduction in length of stays, which tells us that we have essentially found the limits of improvement, and that's one of the real strengths of discrete event simulation too. Is it tells us what are the limits of what the system can do, given that ultrasounds take a certain amount of time that isn't going to change anytime soon, given that echoes take a certain amount of time, consults take a certain amount of time. Discrete event simulation can tell us how many resources we need. Um, or how many resources are useful to um, to optimize the day? Because beyond this, we just about can't improve because of the natural length of time that things actually just take. Um, so, using this then for for implementation science, you know, as I've said over and over again, um, the graphical representation allows non-engineers to participate in building to critique the model. Uh, we generate specific data rather than qualitative recommendations. You know, it's, everybody would like to say we believe we need more space in order to reduce the length of day for for these new moms. It's very arduous, um, but that's qualitative. We can now use this to develop quantitative recommendations to say. We know that if we do this, we will see relative reductions in length of day that we expect to be up to X amount. We know that if we add rooms on the special delivery unit, that we will delay the likelihood of a walk by X percent or X number of days. Um, and the sensitivity analysis allows us to report how confident we are in these recommendations. If you looked at the individual simulation runs of box. You saw there is still a reasonably widespread, but the but it's fairly narrow around around um, sorry, there's a widespread uh, for the individual simulation runs, but the clusters do show a remarkable trend towards um, staving off box as time goes by. So we can report how confident we are, we can generate specific data um, and Providing that kind of information to system stakeholders um, is a very powerful tool for um, arguing for the space that we need and the capacity that, that will allow us to continue to provide the level of care that, um, that we've become known for. So we presented this um, to our planning committee um, and we were able to use it to drive the discussion and understanding of these likely scenarios rather than based on, on speculation. Um, 
So finally, uh, DES, we know we can then, if, if, with, a, with a good model, we can accurately capture system performance, we can inform policy decisions, we can conduct rigorous exper experimentation in silico rather than in vivo. Um, it can really help us avoid bad decisions. Um, sometimes the best ideas don't work out and it's wonderful to have those sort of triaged in simulation before you put them in place in the real world and discover that um, that they didn't work and you have to undo maybe what is a very expensive uh, intervention, systemic intervention. We can make evidence-based recommendations for implementation and support administrative and stakeholder engagement and solutions. So that's my talk. And I am happy at this point to take questions. Thank, thank you so much, you know, the, for the for the for the uh, presentation. I think uh, I'm waiting for if anybody can call in. You know, there's a number on the website that you can call in using the number. But I have a few questions. Uh, first of all, um, how this uh, tool. Um, to provide decision making for stakeholders compared to conventional uh, tools medicine using, including the um, quality improvement tools. This first one. Secondly, can you, can you explain a little bit more how much time you spend on getting the data? Uh, you know, that's uh, you know, I know that's getting the data is a very big part of the work. You know, related to the get model running is relatively straightforward yeah, as long as get the data. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, so. Um, yeah, getting getting the data is is definitely one of the great uh, challenges, and discrete event simulation is a massive consumer of data. We need enormous amounts of data in order to um, in order to build these models and and, and validate them. Um, so this entire process took, I would say, a, a building and validating the model was about six months. Um, now, I had other projects. If this had been my only project, this, it would have been done faster, but um, but not a great deal faster. Um, we informed the model with uh, about two years of retrospective cohort data and, um, and validated it against that same amount. Um, so, yeah, building the model was the work of myself two interns at 10 hours a week, um, and then, uh, of course, the uh, the staff at the Center for Fetal Diagnosis who met with us for meeting after meeting after meeting and provided us with data. Tom Reynolds especially um, provided just spectacular data. Um, and and, uh, and then, so you take the real world data, you process it, and you fit it to curves that are useful in, in the simulation, like I said. So we used a Poisson distribution for arrival, but we had real-world data which informed uh, gestational period at arrival, gestational period um, at a surgery, gestational age at delivery, um, each stratified by the 11 different conditions that we treat. Um, and uh, with you know outcomes, likelihood of memory rupture, all of those things, all of that has to be brought from uh, from retrospective data or or informed in some other way, and, and that's um, and 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 how you get that data and what you do in the absence of data um, needs to be needs to be reported regularly with these models. Um, but we were lucky that we had uh, an extraordinary amount of very, very high quality data that we could use to, to inform the simulation. Yeah. And, uh, remind me of your first question. Yeah, so what's this approach compared to other uh, conventional approach, you know, to addressing this problem, if, you know, if there are any, uh, why this is unique in a sense, you know, providing the stakeholders a you know, different perspective for the problem, you know? I, I think one of the reasons that it's unique is that um, it allows us to very easily take st the, the stochasticity of real-world systems into account. So, um, you know, instead of saying we made assumptions based on mean numbers of patients, based on averages um, and standard deviations, 
we actually create a simulated cohort of individuals that we run through our simulation. And we do that repeatedly with a, a large number of, um, of variations that allow us to make conclusions um, on, on really a very sophisticated treatment of the, of the model. And then, and then additionally, you know, so with traditional operations research methods like maybe mixed integer programming or that kind of thing, where we would attempt to figure out our demand over time and uh, and maybe build time windows into a, a deterministic analysis. Um, it's just not very approachable. You, you know, you look at large columns of numbers and uh, databases and spreadsheets and equations, um, and those things can be really impenetrable to people that don't have extraordinary experience. As a matter of fact, they can be really impenetrable to people that do have experience. Um, and so, uh, the the graphical nature of simulation allows us to um, to interact with these stakeholders in a way where they can see the model. They can see it exists on a blueprint of their system, um, and and they can see that the data it produces is highly representative of the real world data that they interact with on a regular basis um, and and that allows them to to trust the results especially when they see that the output of the simulation is the same as the real world output so, so that's great so I think uh, um, the other question is um, um, so how do conference now? So how do you engage in the um, clinicians? You know how because we you know this is relatively new uh, approach, new new new, new, new approach. How, sorry, this is, how, how do you engage in the, you know, the clinicians to to, to 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 this this approach? We are we are we are relative new to this field. You know, can you explain sure. your experience? You know, how to get the you know um, clinicians on board? Um. My experience, in part, I've been fortunate that um, that I've had very forward-thinking clinicians that I've worked with in my career. Um, but, um, but like I said, being able to represent the clinical system that the clinician is actually engaged in every day um, is is very very useful, and, and being able to to see them, uh, being able for them to be able to see that the simulation model really does represent the real world. Um, additionally, um, you know, I've worked in academic medical centers and, and, and I, I don't I don't know if it would be the same at other facilities, but I but I, I think it would be. And that is, you know, physicians are also scientists and it is when they see the rigor that goes into building these models, when they participate in model building, when they see how we um, take data into account and and use uh, the real world information to inform the model, and that you know the assumptions that we make are clearly laid out. That they are um, uh, narrow. That we're that building the model is a scientific process in addition to an engineering process. That experimentation with the model is done by a scientific method. Uh, I find that physicians uh, are generally um, Compelled by those kinds of aspects. I mean, th these are these are people that are trained in quantitative methods, um, and discrete event simulation is a quantitative method that, that responds to the environment that they've been in throughout their careers. Okay, so this is great. So uh, I'm just wondering, you know, um, I'm less waiting a couple minutes. If anybody uh, on the lines will call in, so I, I pr pr provide the. Information on the on the website or YouTube channels, you know, 508, uh, 585-632-6753. Uh, you can call in your these numbers or you can go to the website to, to click that link, you know, to get to join this call. So, so um, and so at that time we're waiting. I have another question. So what's the next step for you for, for having, you know, moving forward, the implantation, you know, you're going to evaluate this impact in the next couple of years or what, what's the next step? Um, well, the next steps are, uh, so 
I presented part of this to uh, the, the inpatient aspect of this, the planning committee. Um, the outpatient aspects have been uh, presented by uh, other members of the team, including Tom Reynolds. Um, and so our goal, like I said, is to um, is to be able to expand as we are uh, developing new clinical space in the new buildings that we're building here at the Children's Hospital. Um, so, uh, in the event that that, that is successful, and I'm, I'm not in charge of those decisions, obviously, um, then yes, we will go back and, uh, and we will test real-world system performance against the uh, against the performance of the, the simulation prospectively. So uh, the other two, I'm just realizing I forgot to mention what the other two types of validation are. Um, in addition to face internal and external, we have cross-validation, which says if you model a system in two different ways, do the models agree with each other? Um, we will use one type of model, so we can't do cross-validation in this case. And then finally, there's... Um, there's uh, predictive validation, which is do the predictions made when the simulation come true, and that's what we would like to investigate next. Is if we project that 14 beds will have a particular outcome and 17 beds will have another particular outcome, and then we actually build 14 or 17 beds, um, then we will go back and maybe two years from now test our uh, the results against the simulated prediction and and see if we were correct. Now, bear in mind that we can't necessarily do that perfectly because interventions are rarely adopted precisely as they were modeled. And other factors may change. New surgical techniques may develop which change length of stay, um, or we may be able to suddenly treat many additional fetal anomalies uh, which would increase our demand, et cetera. Um, but being able to compare against uh, against real world practice is is sort of the holy grail of this. We want to make sure that we can do this, sure. uh, uh, that we have that predictive validation. Yeah. Great. Um, thank you. I haven't heard anybody calling in. Um, I think uh, there's a couple more minutes, and we'll just wait another minutes or so. Um, last question from, from me. And for those hospitals or facilities that doesn't have this expertise as you have here, what's your suggestion for them if you want to similar work like this? Um, I think there's a couple of different uh, options. Um, so many of the companies which design discrete event simulation software will also do consulting services. I think that's good for small projects um, or for pilot projects. Um, but what I would strongly encourage, and um, and for more detail on this, uh, my paper in uh, the American Journal of Medical Quality. Um, which uh, the first author is a, a colleague of mine named Matthew Rutberg, um, it, which is EPUB ahead of print right now, um, is describes in more detail how to uh, you know what this recommendation is. But uh, what I strongly recommend is that hospitals and institutions that want to use discrete event simulation in order to approach quality improvement problems should hire a developer. Um, as part of their quality improvement team. Um, there is simply no uh, replacing the ability to live and work in the systems that we're modeling. And so being able to do that here at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, uh, I have a number of projects that I've worked on. And, um, and being able to live day in and day out with the people that produce the data, with the people that validate the data, with the people that work in the system, and not trying to come in as a consultant or a hire gun um, to, uh, to model a system with which I'm not familiar is a real benefit. Now, at the same time, 
consulting for pilot projects or for isolated systems, I think is thoroughly appropriate, and I and I do that. Um, and if if people have a specific system that they want modeled and a specific question that they want answered, um, and they're not necessarily interested in deploying discrete event simulation as part of their basic toolkit for solving discrete, uh, solving quality improvement problems, then a consulting arrangement might be more appropriate. Um, and it will certainly be less expensive than hiring someone full time. Um, but if discrete event simulation is to be a regular part of your improvement portfolio, I highly recommend hiring a specialist. Yes. Uh, I think uh, I'll just think there's a couple of questions actually on the Google page. Of, uh, no, did I lose you? I can't tell if I've lost you or not. Do you agree? 